the mythical 3M machine, 1 megabytes of RAM, 1 megapixel display, 1 million instructions per second CPU performance. These were the mythical specs of an imagined powerful computer that was beyond human comprehension. Now I know in the modern world of computers, these specs are laughably tiny. Today's smartphones have hundreds of times more RAM and processors that can perform trillions of instructions per second. But back in the 80s, this spec sheet was the holy grail of computing. This was a world where the best selling personal computers in the world at most would come with 128 kilobytes of RAM, have less than half a megapixel display and came nowhere near to having processors capable of 1 million instructions per second. To put into context how immense the idea of a 3 machine was, when Apple released its revolutionary Macintosh computer in 1984, Steve Jobs insisted that 128 kilobytes of RAM would be plenty for the Macintosh. But as you will later find out, he was dead wrong. The ironic thing about this debacle is that it ultimately led to Steve Jobs being fired from the company he had founded. Mere months after being fired, he founded another computer company which set its sights on solely achieving the creation of the fabled 3M computer. And somehow this company would be both an absolute failure and a spectacular success. This is the story of Steve's little known company that was started in retaliation to Apple ousting him and how in an ironic twist of fate it would wind up saving Apple from dying. This is the story of Next. Before Steve Jobs was ousted from the company he founded, he was a high-flying entrepreneur on top of the world. To set the scene, it's the early 80s. The Apple II is one of the best-selling personal computers in the world. Apple had gone public and had a market cap of billions of dollars, and Steve Jobs, still in his 20s, was worth hundreds of millions of dollars. During this period of meteoric success, Xerox, through its venture arm, had invested a million dollars into Apple before its IPO, and as part of the deal, it allowed Jobs and his team a rare look inside its secretive research labs. What they saw left Jobs in awe. It was a graphical user interface, complete with windows, icons, and a mouse driven cursor. For Jobs, the Xerox Alto, the revolutionary computer that featured the graphical user interface, was the future of computing. At the time, Apple was working on its next revolutionary computer, the Apple Lisa. The Lisa division was started in 1978. The Lisa was originally envisioned as a powerful professional machine with a more sophisticated operating system but still based on traditional text commands. When Jobs saw the GUI at Xerox Park in 1979, everything changed. Practically overnight, he stormed into the Lisa project and declared that they had to pivot. The old vision of a text-based computer was thrown out the window. Jobs forced the team to start over and design a personal computer centered around a graphical user interface. But Jobs' takeover of the Lisa project was far from smooth. Jobs demanded perfection. He pushed engineers to work long hours. Deadlines slipped as Jobs demanded new features. He had a habit of firing people on the spot if he felt they weren't up to the task. Jobs' management style created deep divisions within the Lisa team. By 1980, Apple's leadership began to worry that that Jobs' behavior was jeopardizing the project. The Lisa had ballooned in complexity, cost was spiraling, and morale was crumbling. Eventually, Apple's board made a fateful decision to remove Jobs from the Lisa project. The machine that finally emerged in 1983 was groundbreaking. The first commercial personal computer with a graphical user interface and a mouse, but it also reflected the turmoil of its creation. It was over-engineered, notoriously expensive at nearly $10,000 and too slow to justify its price. But Jobs' obsession with a GUI didn't fade. Instead, it shifted to a smaller, scrappier project within Apple. The Macintosh project was initially conceived in 1979 by Jeff Raskin. It was originally envisioned as an affordable, easy-to-use computer for the masses. In 1981, following Steve Jobs' removal from the Lisa team, he quickly muscled his way into the Macintosh team, using his charisma and authority to take control from Raskin, who eventually left Apple in frustration. What had started as Raskin's modest consumer-friendly computer became Jobs' passion project. A compact, elegant machine with a GUI inspired by Xerox Alto and the Lisa. Jobs was ruthless in enforcing his vision. He insisted Macintosh ship with just 128 kilobytes of RAM, a severe limitation. Apple engineers had tried to warn him that the machine needed about 512 kilobytes of RAM, but Jobs didn't yield. 
The decision, however, would haunt the Mac after launch. Still, the Macintosh had one major advantage, its price. At around $2,500, it cost about a quarter of the Lisa staggering $10,000 price tag, making it vastly more accessible to consumers. Jobs framed the Mac as revolutionary. He hired Ridley Scott to direct Apple's now legendary 1984 Super Bowl commercial, positioning the Macintosh as the computer that would free humanity from the tyranny of Big Brother, which in Jobs' eyes, was IBM. Then at its unveiling in January 1984, Jobs took the stage in front of a packed audience. He revealed the Macintosh as it introduced itself with a voice synthesizer, earning a standing ovation. Initially, the Macintosh was a sensation and sales spiked in the first few months, but reality soon set in. The machine's limited RAM, lack of software and underpowered hardware frustrated users. By late 1984, Macintosh sales began to store. Apple had poured millions into marketing yet by late 1984, the reality was grim. Sales were slowing and Apple's revenue forecasts were slipping. The Macintosh had wild audiences, but it wasn't paying the bills. Inside Apple, tensions rose. Jobs' relationship with Apple's new CEO, John Scully, was beginning to sour. Scully had been handpicked by Jobs in 1983. At first, the partnership seemed promising. But as the Macintosh sales faltered, Scully grew uneasy with Jobs' leadership. Jobs wanted to double down, push the Mac harder, and keep innovating. Scully, on the other hand, favored stabilizing Apple's finances and protecting the company's profitability. The clash came to a head in 1985, when Jobs attempted to stage a boardroom coup, maneuvering to push Scully out of power. But Scully struck first. With the support of Apple's board of directors, he stripped Jobs of all his roles within Apple, removing any authority he had. Humiliated and furious, Jobs eventually resigned from Apple and walked away from the company he had built. To the outside world, it looked like the end of Steve Jobs' story. But to Jobs, he wasn't going to let Apple's board or John Scully have the last word. In late 1985, with $7 million of his own money, Jobs founded Next Computer. He recruited some of Apple's brightest engineers and gave them a bold mission, build a computer five years ahead of its time. With his new company, Jobs' philosophy had changed. No longer was there going to be any constraints or limitations on hardware. He had learned his lesson with the Macintosh, which shipped with only 128 kilobytes of memory at Jobs' insistence. This severely underpowered an otherwise revolutionary machine, hampering its sales. A year after its release, Apple would eventually expand the Macintosh's memory to 512 kilobytes, and sales of the Macintosh began picking up. Jobs had seen this and decided that he was going to build the highest end computer that he could possibly conceive of. In other words, his goal was to achieve the creation of the mythical 3M computer. Now, by that time, Sun Microsystems and Apollo had already created workstations that surpassed the 3M spec sheet. But those workstations were built for scientists, engineers, and researchers, and had an emphasis on raw hardware power. Jobs wanted to bring something new to the market, a 3M machine with creative appeal, both in its hardware design and software experience. He pushed for a sleek, black, magnesium cube design that looked futuristic. The next computer specs blew past the 3M benchmark. Its CPU ran at 25 megahertz, delivering tens of millions of instructions per second, orders of magnitude beyond the 1 million instructions per second target. It shipped with 8 megabytes of RAM, easily surpassing the 1 megabyte goal, and the display was crisp, high resolution, and fully capable of supporting the sophisticated graphical user interface it came with. The operating system itself, called Next Step, was revolutionary, combining a Unix core with a beautiful object-oriented graphical interface. The first Next computer, nicknamed the Next Cube, was launched in 1988, priced at around $6,500 to $10,000, depending on the configuration you bought. It had a cult fan base who absolutely adored the machine. Notably, Sir Tim Berners-Lee invented the World Wide Web in 1989 while working at CERN using the Next computer. Next would release its second computer in 1990. It was called the Next Station, and it was a more practical and affordable version of the Next Cube. The Next station also introduced a more conventional desktop form factor. It was faster, more compact, and easier to integrate.
migrate into offices and classrooms. Despite these improvements, the next station still struggled in the marketplace. Like the cube before it, the next station was a critical success but a commercial failure. In 1982, the company released the next station turbo, an upgraded and more powerful version of the original next station. And sadly, this would be the last computer that next would ever release. Soon after, the company would exit the hardware business entirely. Throughout the five years that the company sold computers, it sold only 50,000 to 60,000 units. For comparison, Apple sold 1 million Macs in 1991 alone. Steve Jobs' relentless pursuit of perfection, while leading to a beautiful and well-engineered product, also led to significant delays and high costs. The company spent huge sums on a state-of-the-art automated factory that was built to churn out machines on a scale that Next never came close to achieving, resulting in massive losses. What Steve Jobs had tried to achieve with the Next computer was try to merge two computing product categories, which were the workstation and the personal computer. The Next computers were workstations, proven by their top-of-the-line hardware and high price. But Steve Jobs marketed them as if they were personal computers, emphasizing how great their user experience was from a software and operating system perspective. He essentially was trying to create a new category of computer, the personal workstation. But the problem with this approach was that if you thought of the next computer as a personal computer, its $6,000 price tag on the low end was astronomically more expensive compared to other personal computers on the market. For example, decent quality Macs were priced at around $2,000. And for the average user, there wasn't much they could do with the next computer that they couldn't do with the Mac. Add to that the fact that the Mac had a far greater software ecosystem and you can see how the next computer stood no chance in the personal computing market. At the same time, as a workstation, the next computer specs weren't that impressive. Sure, it was powerful. But if your main priority for buying a workstation was raw power, you were better off buying other workstations. Some people would point to its price as the reason why it failed. But within the workstation market, computers were commonly priced at above $10,000. What truly mattered to institutions was the performance per dollar of a workstation. While institutions were willing to pay for expensive workstations, they were incredibly sensitive to performance per dollar. When the next computer launched, its $6,500 price tag on the low end, for a similar price or slightly more. Sun and Apollo offered machines that delivered much higher performance. The next computer's value proposition wasn't its raw power, but its intuitive software and elegant design. Unfortunately for most institutions buying workstations, raw performance was the primary metric. They needed a machine to run complex engineering, scientific or financial simulations, not a machine they'd necessarily enjoy using. Essentially, the next computers were caught in between two worlds, and they didn't really fit in in either resulting in Nexus computers being commercial failures. But what remained revolutionary was its operating system. Because its operating system was built from the lens of personal computing, but for a powerful workstation, its operating system was leaps and bounds ahead of most other operating systems built for personal computers. Based on this, Next repositioned itself as a software-only company focused on its operating system and development tools. Next began porting its operating systems to run on more machines, most notably Intel-based PCs and Sun workstations, opening the door to a broader customer base. The company's greater commercial breakthrough came in 1996 with the release of web objects, one of the very first enterprise-grade frameworks for building dynamic database-driven web applications. Companies like Dell, Disney and the BBC adopted it to power their early online platforms. Though Next was now smaller and leaner, it had become profitable and more importantly, strategically valuable. In 1996, Apple was in serious trouble. The macOS System 7 was old, fragile, and lacked modern features like memory protection, multitasking, and a stable foundation. Apple's internal project had burned years and hundreds of millions of dollars, but was nowhere near ready. Apple desperately needed a modern operating system to survive. And on top of that, it was having problems with its leadership, having cycled through many CEOs since Jobs had left. None of its numerous CEOs had been able to 
to steward the company to success. In this moment of crisis, Apple turned to outside options. After failed negotiations with B Inc. over BOS, Apple struck a deal in December of 1996 to acquire Next for $429 million in cash and stock. The deal brought Steve Jobs back, initially as an advisor, ultimately becoming interim CEO and in 1997, later dropping the interim title to resume full control of the company he had co-founded. With Steve Jobs back at the helm of the company he founded, he would integrate Nexus operating system to form the foundation of Apple's macOS and later iOS. What unfolded under Steve Jobs' leadership, simply put, was the greatest business turnaround in corporate history. But that's a story for another day. Thank you for watching.